as we'll talk about here in just a moment, truly faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It's good to have everyone with us today as we have assembled together to worship our Heavenly Father. If you're visiting here with us, we want you to know that you are a welcome guest. And if you have any questions that might arise from what you've seen or what you hear, please give us a chance to answer those questions and to study with you from His most wonderful Word. During the course of this year, off and on, we have been looking at a series of lessons that have been designed to build our faith in 2022. Throughout the course of this, le this series, we've talked about faith and conviction. We've talked about faith and trust. We've talked about having faith when we are alone. And we talked about following the many faith-filled examples of the Scriptures. Today I want to talk to you about, in the final lesson, having faith to overcome. Now, what we showed in our previous lesson, we looked at several examples from the two-part study there, especially from Hebrews 11 is where we pulled it. We showed that as we studied the concept of faith, that these people were fully convinced by God's Word and what it teaches. There's your conviction there. But these people also trusted in God and His Word, being convinced that God is trustworthy. And those are the two sides of faith that overlap that are crucial to our serving the Lord, having the conviction, the persuasion, and the trust. And what we find as we study the Scriptures is that with these, that we most certainly will have the faith to overcome the world. Now, when I say overcome, let's, let's go at this from a biblical perspective. The passage we looked at at the start of the lesson was 1 John chapter 5, 4 through 5. I mean our scripture reading this morning. And here's what it says again. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, please take notice of the words in bold face for just a moment. I'd like to talk about those. First off, let's focus on the word overcomes. The word overcomes is translated from the Greek word nikeo, you'll see on the screen there, and it means to conquer, to carry off to victory. Think about that. To conquer, to carry off to victory. And then in the, word, the verse, we saw the word victory. Well, look at this. The Greek word is very similar. As a matter of fact, it's part of the variations of the word, naki. Conquest, victory. It's much more than a shoe company. It's the idea of victory that we have, conquest that we have. But then there was the word faith in the passage. Now, this should be familiar. We've talked about this faith. It's from the Greek word pistis, and it means persuasion. Conviction of the truth of anything, belief. And then we saw the word believes. Look at the similarity here, pistuo. And it means to have faith with respect to a person or thing, to think that to be true, to be persuaded of. Now let's bring the passage back up. For whatever is born of God overcomes, Nikhil, the world, has conquest. And this is the victory, Nakei, the conquest that he has. He says, and this is the victory that has overcome to have that victory, to have the conquest of the world, our faith, our conviction, our persuasion. Who is he who overcomes Nakei, the world? Who has victory over the world? Who takes conquest from the world? He who believes, he who is persuaded that God is true, who has the conviction that his word is right, he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's who overcomes the world. The one who is persuaded that Jesus overcomes the world. And because Jesus overcame the world, we know that we too can overcome the world. This is what the text says there. We are able to have the faith to overcome through Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus himself. John 16, verse 33. What does he say there? These things I've spoken to you, he says, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. 
but be of good cheer. He says, I have overcome the world. So he tells his disciples here in John 16, that they are going to face tribulations in the world. And he says, don't worry about it because I've overcome the world. And if he's overcome the world, we can overcome the world. Look over here in Revelation 17, verse 14. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. Well, who is the lamb? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. This is why we say that through Jesus Christ, we can overcome the world because he's overcome the world. Revelation is all about one simple word, overcome. This is a message delivered to the saints towards the end of the first century to the saints that would face the immediate persecutions, he's telling them, you can overcome. It doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter the trials and the persecution and the destruction. You overcome through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he has already overcome. He already has given the victory if we will simply follow him. Think about what Paul writes, the latter part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there in verse 57. There's a whole context to this, and keep in mind, all these verses have a context that deserves to be studied, needs to be studied for a greater understanding. But Paul writes, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This word victory is in the same line and thought that we are looking at. Gives us conquest, gives us Victory over the world. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. I don't want anyone to say John preached a sermon where we didn't have to open our Bibles. This will be the only time. All the other verses will be on the screen. But this one we need to. Because of the, the duration of this context. Look at Romans chapter 8, beginning there in verse 31. Victory through Jesus Christ. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. Why? Because we have overcome the world. And we've done it not of our own accord, but through him who loved us. Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We talk about overcoming the world. It is not through our own selves. Yes, we have to make the decision to follow the Lord. We have to make the decision to walk in accordance to his word, be convinced that he is true and his word is true and abide by that conviction. But ultimately, the victory that we have is through Jesus Christ. It is only through him that we can have the faith to overcome. So what happens when we overcome? What's the rewards? What's the benefits, if you would, of overcoming? Well, let's go back to Revelation again. There are seven churches that Jesus addresses in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. These seven churches in part represent all that the saints would have to face. All the challenges that would come upon those who would serve the Lord. Some would walk faithfully and have their garments unstained. Others would walk in accordance to the world and even allow, like the case with Jezebel, teaching adultery within the congregation. So much wrongness and so much right would be present. And so what do you do about all that? How do you endure? How do you fix it? You teach the brethren to fix the issue and persevere so they might 
overcome. And I mean might, I don't mean might as in maybe or possibly, but I mean might as in the power of the Lord to enable us to overcome these things. Let's look at a couple of things beginning there in Revelation 2 verse 7. I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He's talking about that to those who overcome. Now, do keep in mind that a deeper study of Revelation, which our back class is doing, has already looked at the, the, the concept within these passages and the deeper ideas carried here. But look at it from a very simple standpoint. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of garden. Adam and Eve, they were not forbidden from eating from the tree of life. They were forbidden from eating of the God, knowledge of good and evil. But they were cast out of the garden because of their sin, so they would not have access again to that tree of life. That tree of life is the idea of providing life to them. And oftentimes we think of eternal life. Hence the question, well, imagine Adam and Eve living forever in a garden. But that wasn't the point. This tree of life now is illustrated for us as being in heaven. Being available for all those who will overcome. All those who will faithfully follow the Lord and have victory in Jesus. They will eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. They will have this life. I think oftentimes about Ephesians chapter 2. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, God has made alive through Jesus Christ. And this eternal life that we have, this spiritual life that we have, is enjoyed with fellowship with God. And if we will endure the short time on this earth and overcome, then we have this tree of life for us. Look at verse 11 of Revelation 2. To him who overcomes, he says, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. You know, one of the greatest things about living as a, as a child of God, walking in fellowship with our Lord and Savior, is we don't have to fear death. Now, I realize that's a very easy statement to make. But when you are moments away from that point in your life, I know for many, many people, it's a very scary thing. But for the child of God, there should be that comfort to know that in a moment, I'm going to take a step. And after that step, I'm going to be in the hands of my Lord for eternity. The second death, he's not talking about the physical death. He's talking about the death that awaits those who don't serve the Lord, who do not overcome. That's who fears that death. But those who overcome the world, we don't fear that death. We shall not be hurt by that death. Look at another passage here, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He says, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I'll give him a white stone, and on the stone a name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Someone says, great. We got manna for 40 years again. That's not what he's talking about. The idea here of this man is a spiritual reference to, think about what Jesus says. He's the bread of life. Talking about being provided for by the Heavenly Father spiritually. An eternity with God with no needs. With all spiritual things that we would have given to us, we have. Um, Revelation is all about the imagery there. and The pictures that are painted in a human understanding. So that we might at least barely a little bit grasp the greatness of what lies ahead on the other side of that day of judgment. And so the hidden manna to eat. The white stone upon which a new name is written, which no one knows except him who gives it. Again, fellowship's a beautiful term to describe the relationship that we have with God, with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We are walking with him. James tells us that though that we, if we draw, James 4, if we draw near to him, he draws near unto us. And that's the fellowship that we have with him. This is our name being written in heaven. A promise that there is a place laid up for us if we will overcome. Revelation 2, 26 through 28. A little more to the text than what we have quoted, but this is sufficient for the lesson. To him, the one who overcomes, to him I will give power over the nations, and I will give him the morning star. Again, a lot about this we could say regarding Revelation, but suffice it to say that for those who overcome, 
We have no one to fear. We have no fear of the nations. We have no fear of the world around us. All we have is eternal glory with our Heavenly Father in heaven. But the key to this, and keep this in mind with all of these, we have to overcome. If you're going to run a race, and some people do like to run races, some people own cross track and stuff like that. There's a very important thing you have to remember. You don't get the prize if you don't cross the finish line and first. As a kid, it'd been nice if every race that I got to participate in, they gave a prize to the 15th person. Believe it or not, I ran track for a short time in high school. And it was for a short time. And I wasn't on the first team that got to run. I was on the second team. And they never gave me a trophy for coming in 15th. They never gave me a prize for coming in 11th. They never even gave me a prize for participating. I just got to walk away and sulk because I just wasn't a good runner. But the person who did is the one who ran the race to win the race. He crossed the line and he got the prize. And the illustration is used in the scriptures of that type of effort that we need to put in with our lives as Christians. And our striving to overcome. Look at the next one. There we go. To him who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So there's this idea, this imagery that's painted for us in the scriptures of there being a book in heaven, and when one becomes a child of God, their name is entered into the book of heaven. Now, it is all a figure, if you would, to convey the idea that the Lord knows those who are his. But the problem is, is oftentimes people will not continue to walk faithfully before the Lord. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about this. And when that happens, is the idea coming that their names are blotted out of that book of life. Because the Lord no longer knows them. Because they've walked away from his fellowship. For those who return to the Lord and walk and seek to overcome, to seek to serve him, shall overcome. And they shall be clothed in white garments. Their names will not be blotted out. And let's add to that idea there. He says, I will not blot out their names from the book of life. How can you add to that? He will confess. Jesus will confess their name before the Father and before his angels. If he confessed me before men, he said earlier while he was on this earth, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. There's the idea. But in order to get to the stage, we have to overcome. He says, I will make him a pillar in the temple, chapter 3, verse 12. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I'll write on him my new name. I think about Hebrews chapter 12 talks about us coming to a mountain, coming to the new, the heavenly Jerusalem. Many times we look at this and the world wants to see this as some sort of future victory that is to be had in a very physical way upon this earth. Now, the victory is already here. The new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem is already in existence in heaven. It is the body of Christ. And those who overcome, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. To overcome. That is our responsibility. To overcome the world. And these are the results. Chapter 3, verse 21. I will grant to sit with me on my throne, he says. Also, as I, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Victory in Jesus is because he's already victorious. Sometimes we think that, well, when the Lord comes again, he will finally have victory. He already has victory. When he arose from the grave, never to die again, he gained victory over death. When he ascended to the right-hand side of his father to reign over the kingdom until he turns it back over to his father, he already has victory. Now we're just waiting for the day when the world will be judged by him. And all those who have overcome will go to be with him eternally in heaven. You know, though, what is a powerful point 
Paul tells us our citizenship is in heaven, and one day we long to be with him in heaven, folks. Brethren, we're already in fellowship with him now. We're just not there yet. But we are here, and we are walking in fellowship with him. He is overcome. We can overcome. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation 21, verse 7. Look at that again. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my sons. And if we wanted to talk about, well, what about those who don't overcome? That's verse 8. And he lists those who will be cast into the lake of fire. But the point within the text here isn't about those who will be cast into the lake of fire. It's about overcoming. And this is the motivation by which we live our lives. So that we might overcome and inherit all things and be with this God. And not, not be of those who don't overcome. It's a powerful concept and idea that the scriptures conveys to us. An example that is set for us by Jesus himself. And because he overcame, he had victory, so too can we be victorious. So too can we overcome the world. I want you to consider for just a moment... Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. There's two words that are really one word. We talk about overcoming. It requires something very important. The race illustration or analogy we used a while ago, you have to persevere in that race. You know, when you first get started, you're in pretty good shape. Halfway through it, you're kind of hurting a little bit. And as you cross the end, it requires more and more effort. Pulling up from the reserves in your body to keep persevering, to keep going a little bit further and a little bit further until you finally cross the line. Well, this idea of us overcoming the world, it's not easy. It's not a great, it's not a simple task to accomplish. And it requires, it requires endurance. It requires patience. Two words that are for one. Notice in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Hebrew writer. He tells us here in this particular text regarding the need of enduring. He says, therefore, Hebrews 12, verse 1, we also, since we are surrounded by so great, I got to correct something I said well ago. Three times we'll open our Bibles during this sermon. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is cast down at the right, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now the Greek word translated as endurance, let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us is used over in James chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. James chapter 1, the same word. Translated differently in the New King James Version. It says, but let patience have its perfect work. It's the same Greek word there as endurance in Hebrews, the Hebrew text. But let patience have its perfect work. Let endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I skip verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing of our faith produces patience. And sometimes we might wonder, well, how does the Lord test us? By giving us life in this sin-filled world. The life that we have in these mortal bodies is a life that is tested every single day and tried every single day that we live and walk through this earth. Ultimately, this trying of our faith should produce endurance, should it produce patience that will then enable us to overcome. And if we were to look at Ephesians 6, 12 through 13, Paul talks about that our warfare is not against flesh and blood. But our warfare is against principalities and powers. Well, with faith in Christ, we can overcome these principalities. We can overcome these powers. 
We can overcome the rulers of the darkness in the heavenly places, as Paul calls them in Ephesians 6. We can overcome all these things. Someone says, I thought you said we're supposed to overcome the world. That's what we're doing. When you overcome the world, when you overcome all that would be in opposition to you. Who would want to tear you away from the Lord? You put on that armor of God so that with this faith, you can overcome the world. With this faith in Jesus Christ, you can be victorious. Now, if you're not a Christian, this is a battle worth fighting. But you need to pick the right side today. If you've studied the scriptures and you're convinced that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you've been persuaded by the text that he is the one you need to follow, then let's act upon that belief today. Ask the question, what must I do? Because this is the question posed to Peter and the other apostles. And their reply was real simple. Repent. Turn away from your sinful life. Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. You want your sins forgiven? Do you want to be reconciled to God? Then you need to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Be buried with Him through baptism, so you might rise to walk in the newness of life. That repentance changes not only your heart, but your mind and your life. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully, then you're not overcoming You've chosen for a while to join and participate with that of the world. But I would encourage you today, while there is still time, to see the need to repent, to look to the Heavenly Father for the path to return, follow His Word back to Him, and repent and ask Him to forgive you, and He will, and be restored once again to fellowship with Him and having victory through Jesus Christ. If you're subject to the Gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.